time of our lives. The most amazing 60 years in history, as seen through the pages of Time magazine. for the time of our lives, Mr. Jason Robards. I'm here at the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. to help celebrate the 60th anniversary of Time Magazine. Why the National Portrait Gallery? Well, one of its permanent exhibits is a display of the artwork from Time's covers donated in 1978 to this National Museum honoring the nation's immortals. And the exhibit is just another indication that Time Magazine has become as much a part of everyday life in America as network radio or talking pictures or the airlines. And it's older than any of them. All of them are part of the turbulent six decades of world history that Time has covered. Easily the most amazing 60 years in history. For the world, those years from 1923 to 1983 have brought more changes than any other similar period in history. For time, those six decades saw the magazine change from a barely viable experiment into a journalistic institution. And for all of us, that 60-year period is, in whole or in part, the time of our lives. Harry Luce, he hated to be called Henry, and Britt Hatton were mere lads, just 23 years old, when they decided to begin the new magazine they would call Time. Actually, what they had in mind was not just a new magazine, but a new kind of magazine. Hatton and Luce had hoped to raise $100,000 to start the magazine, but after several months, they could sell only $86,000 worth of stock at $25 a share. If you had bought and kept one share in 1923, your $25 investment would now be worth nearly half a million dollars. But at first, the investment didn't look all that good. Haddon was hoping to sell 25,000 copies of that first issue and wound up with a sale of less than 9,000. Maybe time was ahead of its time. For its first cover, the magazine chose a rather sketchy line drawing of former Republican Speaker of the House, Uncle Joe Cannon, who was retiring after a record 23 terms in Congress. The new magazine's coverage, however, was far from skimpy. For 15 cents, those 9,000 adventurous souls who purchased that first issue got 32 pages of news that ranged from the speculation on who would win the 1924 Democratic presidential nomination to a report that King Kama, a Bamangwate, died at the age of 87 in Sarawai, Bokawana land. In between the presidents and kings, the new magazine reported on such matters as famine in the Soviet Union, a new John Barrymore film, and a boy who had his sight improved with the implant of an eyeball from a pig after which the boy signed a contract to appear with the pig in a vaudeville show. Despite pigs and witch doctors, then as now, the first section of Time magazine was devoted to national affairs, or nation, as the department is now called. Time's plan, incidentally, was to deal with the news in what it called a brief, organized manner. And the way Haddon and Luce decided to accomplish that organization was to divide the news into sections or departments with titles such as National Affairs, Foreign News, Aeronautics, Science, Crime, and several others. Over the years, some of the titles have become modernized, but the concept remains the same. The dividing of news into categories was such a successful idea that it has become today's standard format for virtually every kind of news reporting. 
and perhaps the most important national story Time had to cover in its early years broke on October 29, 1929. Time was now six years old and was rapidly gaining a reputation as a force in American affairs. True to its original concept, the magazine reported both sides of most issues and then made clear its own feelings. And in the case of Herbert Hoover, Time's positive feelings about the president and his economic policies were made clear indeed. Even when the market crashed, the magazine was not quick to lose its faith in the nation's economy or its president. Clearly, Time and others failed to see the years of despair that lay ahead. And like Herbert Hoover, the magazine was already seeing some false light at the end of the economic tunnel. This was its report on November 4th. 1929. By Tuesday morning, the suspicion that there might be a panic had turned to the apprehension that there was a panic, wild with the rumors of ruin and suicide. As shades of Tuesday evening fell, it seemed the worst was past. A belated ticker recorded gains in significant stocks. Hysteria, it was hoped, had met its master in the banking power of the United States. Unfortunately, that banking power of the U.S. was not as great as time had hoped. It is just one of the errors in judgment we may hear in the words of time. But it must be remembered that the words we hear were written at the time the events occurred. We will relive the passions of the moment unfiltered by the hindsight of history. The stock market continued to fall and before long the nation and the world were in the grip of history's worst depression. Millions of Americans began to look for new leadership. The search would end on a sweltering July night at the 1932 Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Their choice was New York Governor Franklin Delano Roosevelt. FDR would, of course, win a smashing victory. And along with the rest of the nation, time seemed willing to back the new president with complimentary words. And with remarkably vivid words. Ten times ten thousand men, women, and children had gathered before the inaugural platform. They blackened 40 acres of park and pavement. Instantly, President Roosevelt, without hat or overcoat in the chill wind, swung around to the crowd before him, launched vigorously into his inaugural address. His easy smile was gone. His large chin was thrust out defiantly as if at some invisible, insidious foe. A challenge rang in his clear, strong voice. For 20 vibrant minutes, he held his audience, seen and unseen, under a strong spell. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. The 12 years of the Roosevelt administration were perhaps the most dramatic in American history and Time Magazine carried on a kind of love-hate relationship with the Democratic president. But in 1945, when Roosevelt died, the magazine was quick to recognize his greatness. On Okinawa by noon, the news was known to the men at the front, at the far sharp edge of the world's struggle. With no time for grief, they went on with their work. But there, while they were, many a soldier wept. Everywhere, to almost everyone, the news came with the force of a personal shock. It was the same through that evening and the next day and the next. The darkened restaurants, the shuttered nightclubs, the hand-lettered signs in the windows of stores, reading, closed out of reverence for FDR. And then the magazine quoted the greatest tribute possible in that war-torn year of 1945. 